Let's pray together. God, we thank you for your goodness. God, we just reflect on the words of that song. God, you are good. We thank you for the breath in our lungs, for waking us up today, and for the chance to worship you together. God, we ask that you open our hearts for what you have for us today. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. My name's Paige Peltier, and I get to welcome all of you to Chapel Street Church at our Kesslinger campus, and welcome to those of you online as well. If this is your first time here, we are really glad that you have chosen to worship with us, and we would love the chance to get to know you a little bit better. So you can open the camera on your phone and scan the code on the back of the seat in front of you and fill out the Connect card. And then we would also love it if you could stop by our welcome desk, and we would love to answer any questions that you have as well as give you a small gift. And then if you are new or newish, we have our Next Steps lunch coming up at the end of the month. And this is a great time. I remember at our last Next Steps lunch, we had people, it was their first Sunday here, and we had, been, we had people who had been around for a year or so. And so if you are in that bucket, you're invited to our Next Steps lunch. This is a great time to hear who we are, what are we about at Chapel Street Church, and how can you be involved. You get to meet some of our staff, as well as hear kind of our mission and vision from Pastor Jeff, and, and there's lunch. So you are invited, and we would love to have you join us, so go ahead and register for that if you fit into that bucket. We would, again, love the chance to get to know you a little bit better and help you find a place of connection here at Chapel Street. And then we also believe that part of our worship is through generosity. Maybe you were here at Biblical Stewardship event yesterday, and um, you know that that's the heart of what we believe we are called to as believers is being generous and that's part of our worship and we want to thank you for your generosity there's a lot of ways that you can give and partner in the ministry that is happening in our church in our neighborhoods and around the world through chapel street church and through god's goodness and his faithfulness and so along those lines we want to share with you a little thank you from our serve the world partners this past advent and if you're online you aren't going to see the video but you will hear the audio so just picture a cute family and you'll you'll have it in your mind. All right, let's check it out. Well, we are humbled by Chapel Street Church meeting its serve the world goal. And it's gonna make a huge impact uh, in our war torn African country at Hope School. Uh, we're packed, we're ready to go. We're flying out of O'Hare this morning. Uh, in our suitcases is more than 100 pounds of books. And uh, your gift is going to impact us being able to go from using 20% of the facility to all of the facility in the next couple years, grow to more than 1,000 students, in the next decade impacting more than 10,000, and then including their family members, that's a, a direct impact in the next decade of like more than 100,000 people and indirectly millions as we pray for a movement of house churches in the tens of thousands. We are so thankful. Thank you. Thank you, Chapel Street, for all your love. Um, we've just been so blessed, and not just with finances, but with mentor teachers and people volunteering and wanting to come. And um, we're just so thankful. So thank you. Yeah, thanks so much. This gift is not only going to be able to help us reach the students we have now, but the students in years to come. And it's so exciting to be able to share Jesus with all of them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's fun to hear from uh, Doug and Carrie, and they are back in, uh, in, their, in, their, in their country in Africa serving there. The reason you didn't see it online, we don't, we don't tell you that what country is, is to protect their anonymity because they do put themselves at risk to serve there. If you're not aware of what we're talking about, during the, the Advent season, from the, right after Thanksgiving until the end of December, uh, we uh, tell you the story of one of our Serve the World partners, ask you to pray for them, and consider giving toward a project that would advance the mission of God in their ministry. And this year, that project was Hope School. They grew up in this area. They met at Taylor University. They, they, God called them to serve in this part of the world. And he blessed them with opportunities to build this school. Um, and we set a goal to raise a half a million dollars in Advent. And I'll be honest, uh, about two weeks in, I thought, we're not going to make it. My wife tried to be. You have little faith, you know, she said. But I thought, well, this might be a tough one. And um, as time went on, I'm, and you've heard this, I want to tell you that from end of November to December 28th, you gave 
uh, toward that mission. And that check has already been written and sent. Yeah. But many of our church family members gave to serve the world after that to the end of the year to the tune of 120 additional thousand dollars. That's almost $650,000 given outside of our walls to bless not only Hope School, but our other serve the world partners. And I felt, uh, quite frankly, like God was shaking his finger, like you didn't have faith, you know? So, so I just want to say to all of you who prayed and who have given whatever amount, thank you. God is using your generosity to expand his kingdom in ways that we barely comprehend, and it's a thrill for us to tell you those stories and invite you into that journey. So again, thank you for your generosity and your prayers. We look forward to telling you more about what God is doing. Uh, One other announcement for you, uh, that is, uh, we're in a series called uh, The Gospel in Genesis. And in a couple of weeks, we're going to get to, uh, it really it's about God's good design uh, in the beginning, how he designed the world. We're going to continue with that series this morning. In a couple of weeks, we'll get to his design for us as human beings. How did he make us? What does it mean to be made in the image of God and the implications of that? And this event on February 26th is called Good Design, specifically addressing uh, a couple of things. What is God's good design for human sexuality and gender? There's a lot of confusion and mixed messages in our culture about that. And so this is an event for our church family to equip us in two areas. Number one, to get clear about what the Bible actually teaches about these things. And number two, to learn to love our neighbors well who may not know or may not agree with what the Bible teaches. Because we're called to do both. Hold fast to the word of God and love people who are of all different views. So uh, we encourage you to attend and we invite you to be there. We've invited four top uh, scholars and experts on these issues in the country. Uh, You can find out more information online, but I invite you to take advantage of that. And to registration is open now. We're hoping God will bless this and use this to help us grow in both of those areas. With that said, let's pray before we come to God's word. Father, thank you for your good design in this world, which we're learning about. Thank you that you are good, as we heard last week, and we can trust you in all things. Open our minds and our hearts now to your word. Help me to communicate it clearly and help us to receive what you would teach us and speak to us. We pray this in the name of Jesus, the living word. Amen. Last week, uh, how many of you were here or heard online Dr. John Dixon's sermon last week? If you missed it, you missed out. You really missed out as we kicked off this series. But there's good news because you can still go back and watch and or listen to that. I encourage you to do that if you missed it as he helped us understand that the book of Genesis is, is not... It's not ancient uh, mythology. It's not written by people that were credulous and and ignorant. It's sophisticated literature, and it's life-changing stuff. And I was moved by that, and we're going to continue in that series. Uh, We're calling this series The Gospel in Genesis. Gospel is from the Greek word euangelion, meaning good news. What is the good news in Genesis? Well, Genesis 1 to 3, we've said, lays down the foundations for us to understand all of life's big questions. Who is God? Who are we? How do we relate to this world and to him and to each other? And what's wrong with the world and how will it one day be put right? The Bible lays out that that story, but the foundations for answering those questions are laid in the first three chapters of the book of Genesis. That's why we're calling it the gospel in Genesis. Tremper Longman wrote a book called How to Read Genesis. You'll see a copy of it in the little corner book area nook over there. It's a great, great book if you want to track along and learn about more about this. He writes this, it would be impossible to overstate the importance of Genesis for our time today. We tend to think of this as a, it's ancient, it's, it's mythological, it's, it, these are people so far removed from us culturally. Uh, how, how, what does it have to do with me today? I think almost everything, if we understand it properly. The word Genesis itself comes from a Latin word meaning beginnings, which it's from a Greek word meaning the birth of, or to be born into. So it's the, the origin story. I read John Dixon's essay this this past week called The Genesis of Everything, dealing with that very thing. Listen to this quote from Dr. James Kennedy, the founder of Knox Theological Seminary. He writes this, Genesis presents to us the foundational underpinnings of everything else in the Bible. The origin of the solar system, the origin of the atmosphere, the origin of the hydrosphere, the origin of life, the origin of humanity, the origin of marriage, the origin of evil. Genesis explains to us the origin of language, government, culture, nations, and religion. If Genesis were removed from the Bible, the rest of the Bible and most of life itself would become incomprehensible. I quite agree with him. 
It's, it's critically important for us to understand. So uh, this week and next week, we're going to look at Genesis 1, uh, the rest of chapter 1 before the, uh, verse 26, where we're made the image of God in two parts. This week, verses 1 to 13, the good news of a creator. Next week, verses 14 to 25, the good news of creation. We're going to take our time walking through these first few verses. So let's begin with Genesis 1, 1 through 13. You can follow along with me. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. And God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse. And it was so. And God called the expanse heaven, and there was evening, and there was morning the second day. And God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place. And let the dry land appear, and it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together he called seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees, bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind, on the earth. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed, according to their own kinds, and trees bring fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening, and there was morning the third day. Now last week, uh, John Dixon told us that there's a lot of controversy swirling around Genesis 1 and how to understand it. And I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that many of you know what some of those are. We're not going to get into all of them, but as soon as you read a text like that, many of our minds go right to debates about what? Creation, evolution, age of the earth, these kinds of things, microbiology, fossil records. For example, the question, is the earth 6,000 years old or 14 billion years old? Did God create all that exists in an instant, in six literal 24-hour days, or over ages? These are the kinds of questions that have, quite frankly, divided Christians in recent generations. We argue about them and sadly divide over them. But I want to ask this question. Are these really the questions, the text we just read, and we'll read again the next section next week, are these really the questions Genesis 1 is trying to answer? One of the foundational principles of, of biblical interpretation when you read the Bible is to ask yourself this question. What did the original author intend to say through this text? What did God intend to say through that original author? So do we really believe that the original author was trying to explain to us, the age? God could have been clearer about the age of the earth if he wanted to be, or about how. Speaking of the how God created, do you know how long a single double strand of, of, of your DNA would be if you stretched it out? Or all, if you stre put it this way, if you stretched out all the DNA strands in all the cells of your body, go to the sun and back. Think of it, that's just this, the DNA in your body, which God coded. How would, how would we possibly, our little pea brains, understand if God was going to explain how? Our heads would explode, and then where would we be? <laughs> I don't think that's what God intends here. Now, the Bible is the inspired and authoritative word of God. We can trust it. But it's not written as a scientific textbook. It's not answering those questions we try to make it answer sometimes. We must, Frederick Peter wrote this, to try to read the book of Genesis as a science textbook is like trying to read Moby Dick as a whaling manual. It's to miss the point entirely. Now that's not to say the Bible is anti-scientific, not at all. Where it does speak to matters of science, it's utterly trustworthy. And that's been proven again and again. 
It's also helpful to know that these debates that sometimes Christians have today, and maybe you grew up in a tradition where there's only one way to read this book, and you think, if I don't believe X, then I can't be here, or if I don't believe Y, these debates are not new. In fact, they're they're quite old. Uh, Philo of Alexandria, who I did know about, but didn't know his view of Genesis until I talked with John Dixon at our preaching team meeting, Philo uh, Alexandria writes, says, claim, wrote, a, wrote a treatise uh, on the, the God's work of, of creation in Genesis. And his view was that God created everything that exists in an instant. And the six-day description is a way of describing the order he intended he put into his creation. Now, why have I tell you that? Not so that you should believe what Philo believed, not at all. But to illustrate the point that long before Modern debates about fossil records and molecular biology and and carbon dating and age of the earth, long centuries before that, people who loved God and loved the word of God had differing opinions about how to understand this. And I want to just say to all of you here, that's okay here at Chapel Street for us to wrestle with these things. We don't all have to agree on the how, but here's what we want to understand and agree on. What is Genesis 1 actually saying to us about the creator? What is the good news about a creator? That's what I want to focus on. The very first lines of the book of the Bible, in the beginning, God created. It's not just in Genesis 1, by the way. It's all throughout Scripture. Of course, Genesis 1 is about the Creator, but all of the Bible is telling us and declaring to us that God is speaking to us, the Creator, through His creation. Some of you will know Psalm 19, famously, verses 1 through 4. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims His handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There's no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice, that of the, of the created heavens and, and creation itself, goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. Doesn't matter where you live on this planet, or when you lived in history, the created order is saying something, proclaiming something, declaring something about the one who made it. The Apostle Paul puts it this way in Romans chapter 1, verses 19 through 20. For what can be known about God is plain to them, and to us, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. So they, we, are without excuse. God is declaring and proclaiming about who he, about who he is, what he's like, through what he's made. It's now... That's not the only way he declares himself. I've shared this analogy before, but you could, there's nonverbal communication, right? I can communicate certain things to you without words. I can look at you and give you a smile or a nod, and you know that I like you. I could look away. I could ignore you entirely, right? There's different ways with our posture, our facial expressions, we can communicate. Quite a bit, actually. But how could I tell you, hey, let's meet at Chipotle at 145 today for burritos? Can I say that to you without words? No, I, I'm going to have to write or speak something, or you're not going to get the message. Maybe I could act out burritos and I'm driving. I don't know, but it'd be pretty hard, right? The words are required. So God has not only declared about, about who he is and placed a longing in, in our hearts to know him, and every person who's lived understands this to a degree, right? Every human being has stood at a, a seashore or a mountain vista or stared into a, a newborn's face and had that moment of, of longing, of wonder, of awe. Even if they don't connect it to God, God is still speaking to them. But not only that, God's actually given us words. His word. Specific words about who he is and what he's like. So that we would know him. As we come to Genesis then, let's look at what this creator is like. Four things about the goodness of the creator. First, the creator is eternal. Notice, immediately, the very first line of the very first chapter of the very first book of the Bible. Verse 1. In the beginning... God. In the beginning, God created. God is not explained. He's not, there's not a philosophical explanation for why or how he exists. There's no uh, definition of what happened before him. It's just assumed. The very first word is, in the beginning, God. He pre-exists and precedes everything. The reality of his existence is fundamental to understanding everything else that flows. Getting the order right. The late professor uh, Harlow Shapley of Harvard, he was the head of the Harvard uh, astronomy department and the head of their observatory in the 1920s and 30s. He said, some people say in the beginning God, I say in the beginning hydrogen. 
Okay. But the point is, in the beginning, something. Where did hydrogen come from? How did we get it? In the beginning, God, everything else flows from him. This really is the clear dividing line of Genesis. Friends, the dividing line of Genesis chapter 1 is not how old you think the earth is. It's whether or not you will accept the first three words. First four words, in the beginning, God. Whether or not you're willing to accept the pre-existent eternal nature of the creator himself. That's the line that's being drawn in the sand. Most false religions begin with us, human beings, and work our way to a notion of God through some system. Christianity is fundamentally different. In the beginning, God. It begins with God, not you. You are not the center of the story. You're in it, but not the center of it. God, the fundamental and foundational reality behind all things. And all throughout scripture we see this. In Colossians 1, Paul says he's above all things. He's preeminent on all, and in him all things hold together. The firstborn over creation. Hebrews tells us that all of the universe is held together by a word of his power. So the great dividing line of Genesis is not debates over the age of the earth. It's whether or not we will acknowledge this reality, this fundamental fact. Pastor Brian and I were talking about this uh, last week. And he said, um, he quoted somebody, I can't remember who. He said, those who debate about the age of the earth or how, how God did this are like people on opposite ends of the same canoe. Those who say in the beginning hydrogen or there's no God are in a totally different ocean. We have far more in common is the point. The reality of God precedes everything. Oxford uh, University professor of mathematics, John Lennox, uh, I was listening to a podcast with him recently and reading some of his work. He talks about the law of gravity. And he said the mathematical law of, what we call the law of gravity is a mathematical formula. And it can explain to you how heavy bodies relate to each other in motion. With, with precise accuracy. What it cannot do is tell you what gravity is. It can only tell you what gravity does. It can explain to you how it works, how it operates, but it can't tell you why gravity is or what gravity is. Are you following? The point he's making is there's a fundamental reality behind that law. A lawmaker, in other words. In the beginning, God. The Bible begins with this fundamental reality, and by the way, the Bible ends with this reality as well. It's bookended by the reality of the eternal nature of God. Revelation 22, verse 13. If we can go there. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. In the beginning, God. In the end, God. And everything in between, God. C.S. Lewis writes about uh, what, what difference does God being eternal make to our life? You might intellectually agree, or believe, but okay, but how does that impact me? And sometimes it's hard for those of us living in time to comprehend what it means for God to be eternal. He says, uh, he talks about it this way. We think of our lives as, if I could draw it here, as a line segment array. We've got point A in our life and point B in our life and point C in our life and so on. And in order to go from point A to point B, you must leave point A to go to point B. And you must leave point B to go to point C. And so we think about God being eternal as, well, God knows what's going to happen in point B before I get there. But God's not on this line. Lewis says we must think of God as, on, as the entire page on which that line is drawn. Not the entire page, the entire book in which it's written. So he's not like looking ahead to see what you do. Because here's, here's what trips us up. Some of us think, well, if God knows everything before it happens, then do, am I really free? Am I, do I have any choice in the matter? Or am I just doing what he knows I'm going to do anyway? But to, for God is outside of time. He's eternal. So A, B, C, D, all points of your life exist in the moment now to him. He's not looking ahead to see what you will do. He's looking at what you have done, are doing, and will do as, a, as an eternal now to him. For example, when you got up this morning, made your coffee, put on your nice clothes, and decided to go to church, were you thinking, I am not free to do this, I must go to church, the Lord is forcing me to drive? Like I, no. No. You were making choices. God sees what you did, what you're doing, and what you will do the same way. So what does that mean for us? We can trust this eternal God. All the things which perplex us about the future and how it's going to work out and where it's going, God sees it all right now. We're safe with that eternal creator. Next, the creator is all-powerful. 
The creator is all. Now, this might be assumed if you accept the premise that the creator is eternal source of, of all things and eter- before all things, but it's an undeniable declaration of Genesis 1, and it matters that we understand it. Genesis 1, verse 3. It's easy to gloss right past this because we read it so often and it becomes familiar to us. And God said, let's read this together, shall we? And God said, let there be light, and there was light. That is one of the most profound sentences in all the Bible. God said, by the power of his word alone. Here's a question. It's not until day four that God creates sun, moon, and stars. Where, if God said, let there be light, and there was light, where did the light come from? Where where did he get the light? Is it some eternal flashlight God has? What, What was it? It's him. He is the light. All other lights, physical, spiritual, intellectual, are derivative lights because he's before all things. In the beginning, God. He needs nothing to create. So in the beginning was what? God and there's nothingness. There's a void, there's darkness, there's this expanse of just nothing. What did the expanse of nothing do to receive the gracious creator's act of creation? What did nothing do to become something? What's the answer? Right, good, good job. Nothing did nothing, right? <laughs> to get, so the, the, the very act of creation is God, a, a generous, creative God who has no need in himself. He's not lonely or bored, but it, he speaks and things happen. He needs no raw material. He's the all-powerful one. Now, in Genesis 1.1, we're told God created. The Hebrew word there for created is the word bara. And it's only used in the Bible of God. Now, later in the Genesis account, the word asa is used, and that's the word to make, and that's used of God. It's also also applied to humans. We also make things uh, because we're like God. We're creative as well. We make things from the raw material God creates. But only God speaks and things happen from nothing. The Latin term for that you may know is ex nihilo. In the beginning, God spoke and stuff happened. He needed no raw material. No master plan. He just says it, and it is. He makes it. God said, let there be light. And there was light. By the way, the Bible begins with light that is not the sun. Do you know that also in Revelation 22, it ends with a light that is not the sun? Did you know that? Look at Revelation 22. Well, it's not actually on there, but it is in your Bible. Revelation 22, (laughs) verses 4 through 5, puts it this way. And I should have brought my glasses. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever with him. In the beginning, God said, let there be light, and there was light, his light. And in the end, when the new heavens and new earth are recreated, the same will be true. We will need no other light but him. We see the same power of God speaking and things happening in the New Testament work when Jesus comes on the scene. In Matthew chapter 8, this will be familiar to some of you, verses 26 through 27, that famous story when the storm comes on the Sea of Galilee and the disciples who fished all their life are terrified for their lives and Jesus is asleep in the boat. First of all, that's a little weird. Like, I don't know, I, I, I don't know about napping in a boat in a storm, but he is. And they're terrified. He said to them, why are you afraid, O you of little faith? Then he rose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm, and the men marveled, saying, what sort of man is this that even the winds and the sea obey him? What sort of man is this? It's the same one who said, let there be light. The same one who said, let there be an expanse above and below, separated the water from dry land. The one who spoke and made the wind and the sea can speak and calm the wind and the sea. That's what sort of man that is. Second, or third, the creator is intentional. The creator is intentional. Now, John did a brilliant job last week uh, walking us through uh, where where we see God's good intentional design in Genesis 1, uh, all through chapter 1. But we look a little closer here at verses 1 through 13, or 3 through 13. We see the intentional, purposeful, orderly. The entire account here is showing us that God is a God of order, not a God of chaos. And we see this in specifically a few phrases that are repeated. I want you to listen for them as we read through Genesis 1, 3 through 13. We see again, again, I'll I'll just underline the key words. God said, whoops, let's go back there. 
go forward one slide. I forgot to do this. There we go. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light was good. Which that's a key word as well. And he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day. The darkness he called night. And there was evening. And there was morning the first day. Go one next slide. And God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters and let it, sep- let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse. And again, here's this word, separated. And God separated the waters that were under the expanse and the waters that were above the expanse. And it was so. And God called the expanse heaven. And there was evening, and there was morning, the second day. And God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together in one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together he called the seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed and fruit trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind on the earth. And it was so. This is the key word here. Each according to its kind on the earth, and it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their own kinds, and trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening, and there was morning the third day. We can spend a lot more time than we have on this, but sometimes what's referred to in Genesis 1, or the first three days, or the first two and a half days, are the days of forming. God is forming the earth, and then the 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 second section of Genesis 1 is the days of filling. God is filling the earth. In fact, in the second half of day 3, we see God beginning to fill the earth with vegetation and plants and and fruit-bearing trees according to their kind. The whole point here, God is intentionally ordering something for a purpose. Notice how often we see this word, God separates. Did you catch that? I was circling it, so hopefully you did. He separates. What is that about? The work of separation is an intentional work of order by the Creator. Light from darkness, expanse above and below, dry land from seas. He's bringing order to the world in which he's speaking into existence. Day two of creation is all about this intentional ordering by separation, expanse of heavens and waters. Now this is debated. Christians freak out and get super nerdy about whether or not this is the, there was a canopy or there's the hydrosphere and the atmosphere and did it break and then there was a flood in Genesis 6. And look, I, we can, that's technical stuff which I don't think is the primary point. The point is, this is an ancient description telling us that what we understand as the atmosphere, the sky, the heavens, all that exists, God did. Ordered ordered it, separated it, made it distinct, set it apart the way it is for his purpose and glory. For the creator to fill it. And the second half of day three is his filling. We see more of God separating, ordering in day three, preparing, and then he begins to fill it. And when he fills it, he fills it specifically by saying it, let the earth bear, let, 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 let vegetation come forth. So he's speaking and things happen. He didn't need a seed to produce a plant that produces seeds. But then he also says, according to their kinds. Did you catch that? That's going to come up again next week. Here's what that means. We see both the supernatural creative act, barah, of God, making things by the power of his word, and the natural law which will reproduce according to their kinds. So God is creating this world, and in this world that he creates out of his power, he's infusing order and laws that we can know, that we can understand. Science is the tracing out the path of God in creation, that which he's created. Order, separation, distinction in the natural world. By the way, day three of creation is the last time that God will, uh, will name things. He calls the, dry, the, sea, the, the, sea, the sky, and he calls it dry land, and he calls it sea. But who's going to begin to name things later on in the story? Adam, Adam, the first man. God is going to bestow on his creature part of his role to name, to call. The intentional order, specificity, and complexity in creation in Genesis 1 is undeniable. Hugh Ross, uh, who wrote the creation and the co- creator of the cosmos, and uh, he said he was a, an unbeliever, but he came to Genesis 1, and he was a scientist, a physicist, and he read it, and he realized, this is describing to me what I already know from my study of science. As one physicist puts it, it almost seems like the universe knew that life was coming. 
When you read through it, you see the, the, the distinction, the order, the specificity. In fact, atheist uh, scientist Francis Crick uh, wrote, put, put it this way. He looks like a, a brilliant physicist, doesn't he? Francis Crick, he's a co-discoverer of the structure of DNA. Uh, he asserts that complexity and order necessary for life to begin on Earth, any life, could not have arisen through simply natural processes. So in other words, he's, he's an atheist. He's acknowledging there's so much complexity and diversity and specificity, sometimes referred to in, in part as the fine-tuning of the universe. So much precise order is needed for life to exist. This could not possibly happen randomly or naturally. Therefore, he suggests that life must have been brought to Earth by aliens from another planet. <laughs> you laugh at that, but this guy is brilliant, and this is a, a, a view that's held by, by many. In fact, this term for it is panspermia. Who see the movie Prometheus? Right? That's based on this view. One guy. Way to go. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> Maybe it's not as well known. Anyway. The point, here's the point. A brilliant scientific mind is saying, I acknowledge there's no way this happened randomly or naturally. It had, something had to, come, it had to come from outside. Okay, well, that, all that does is what? Push the question back further. Where'd they come from? If the aliens brought life here, where'd they come from? I, I don't believe aliens exist, but if they did, there's something behind them. There's a first cause, in other words. Sounds like a leap of faith. And we're going to see as we go, science and faith are not at odds. They, they, they connect beautifully. We see that throughout the story of Genesis. Last, the creator is relational. The creator is relational. I don't know if you've ever noticed before that in Genesis 1, the first three verses, we see the Trinity. You ever notice that? The Trinitarian nature of God in the first three verses of Genesis. Let's look at it together. In the beginning, God, and this, by the way, is the Hebrew word Elohim, and it's plural. In the beginning, Elohim, plural, created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the spirit, this is the Hebrew word Ruach can mean wind, breath, or spirit, was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. Okay, we have Elohim, God the Father, and get the pearl indicating that there's more going on than just as one singular uh, person of this God. And then we see the spirit of God, Ruach, but where's the sun? We get one little hint here, and God said, and to make sense of this, we have to jump ahead to the New Testament in John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. And if you've ever read John chapter 1, the first 10 verses, you know John is clearly, obviously echoing the Genesis 1 creation account when he writes this. We'll look at it here. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. You see this word repeated. Word. The Greek word logos. Uh, in Greek philosophy, it referred to something like a first principle, like a, a, a fundamental principle behind the universe or all things. And philosophers were trying to align their, figure out what this principle was and, and figure out how do I live in a way that aligns with the universe, the Logos. John says there is a first principle behind it all, and it's the Word of God, meaning the Son of God. Because later John will say the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So in Genesis 1, we see Elohim the Father, we see Ruach the Spirit, and God speaking, creating by his very Word. The Son of God, the third person, second person of the Trinity, is the creative agent in creation, making it happen. Let me put it this way. Genesis 1 says, in the beginning... John says in the beginning, John 1 says in the beginning was the word. Genesis 1 says God created the heavens and the earth. John 1 says through him all things were made. Genesis 1 says God said let there be light. John 1 says the light shines in the darkness. Jesus, the word logos of God, is the very agent of creation. Now, God didn't create all this out of some relational need he had. He wasn't lonely. Creation itself is the overflow of this loving God within himself. 
Last week, John Dixon talked to us that all of creation is a gift of love. He's pouring out who he is. A singular person that where no one else exists can't love, but that's not God. God is three in one, eternally existing in perfect loving harmony. And we see all three at work in the story of Genesis 1 and creation. Speaking of Genesis 1, let me give you a little illustration as we wrap up here. Our first house, my wife and I, our first house was 474 Brook Drive in Crystal Lake. Little tiny two-bedroom ranch. We prayed about, could we ever own a home? Didn't, I was a young youth pastor, didn't have much, and we scraped together enough to, to put a down payment and buy this little house. Our first two children were born in that house. We loved that house. I remember putting the flower boxes on our two windows, and, we, and years later when we moved, we, drove, we would drive by when we went to visit my parents in Crystal Lake. We'd always go by Brook Drive. It was out of the way, but we wanted to go down that street just to see our first house. My wife would get so upset when the flower boxes were taken down, and they weren't taking care of the things that we'd done. And he said, well, I, J- Jeff, tell me the story of your, ho- of, your, of your first house. I could tell you the story of the house. I could tell you when it was built, 1974. I could tell you the construction and what was used, the materials that were used, and how the, the windows were made. And I could t- my, actually, I couldn't tell you all that, but a, a builder could tell you the story of the house. But that probably isn't what you're asking, is it? You don't really, you know, when you say, tell me the story of your first house, you're not telling, you're not, you don't really want to know about the nails and the screws and the wood and the concrete. What well, you're asking, tell me the story of your home. There's another way to tell the story, which is the home, the home in which we live, the home in which we had our first children, the home in which we raised them and then that we, we became a little family together, the memories, the stories. Genesis 1 is not really the story of the house. It's in there, but it's primarily telling us the story of the home that God is making, that God is building, and God is going to fill with life, with his image bearers, with his presence and glory. That's the story we should be asking about and wanting to come to understand through Genesis chapter one. Here's how the apostle Paul puts it in 2 Corinthians chapter four, verse six, as we close. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. It's all leading to him. The God who said, let there be light, and there was light, is doing the same thing in our hearts through his word and through his son. Let's pray together as we close. Father God, you are the eternal, all-powerful, intentional, relational, loving, and good creator. And you have made this world out of your glory, goodness, and love. And you've placed us in it. We often don't feel at home in this world and in this life. We're longing for things. But we see here hints in Genesis chapter 1 that it's you we long for. It's you we find our home in. And you will come to dwell with us. You have done that through your son and you will do that when he returns. We give you all the praise and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Before the benediction and you're dismissed today, if you are here this morning and in need of prayer, Maybe it's been a hard week or you're struggling with something. There are members of our prayer team every week that would love to meet with you, to encourage you, to pray for you, and to pray with you. You can meet them back, back there in the glass room. They'd love to pray with you there. Now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance to you and give you his peace. Amen.